Michael Hudgens, thanks very much indeed for coming back onto Evolution Soup. You are a systematics and evolution master's student studying paleontology at the University of Alberta, Canada, and your main research centers on late Cretaceous primitive bird-hipped dinosaurs known as Thessalosaurs and the prehistoric creatures of the Triassic period. Last time we explored the origin of dinosaurs, but today we're going to be diving deep into the age of the Earth and everything on it and how we can know for certain how old everything really is. Well, your research is usually based in Canada, but you're back in the States with your family during the current pandemic. So what's it like for a dinosaur hunter when you can't get out into the fossil beds? Well, thank you for having me on Evolution Soup again, uh, talking about geology, paleontology, and evolutionary biology. It's always a pleasure talking about these subjects into the uh, general public. So as a paleontologist who goes out into the field every summer, it has been odd uh, this year because of the current pandemic in 2020, um, not just for me, but for every paleontologist uh, who goes out in the field. Um, so we collect data uh, for our research, for paleontological research, by going out into the field to collect fossils. And due to this pandemic, due to COVID-19, uh, my summer plans and a vast majority of other mm -hmm. paleontologists have been adjusting slowly, or in my case, have been adjusting slowly to staying at home and catching up on taking measurements and analyzing data for fossils from previous fossil museums and fossil uh, museum collections. And me personally, I've been just taking these measurements and also writing the introduction and writing various chapters for my master's thesis up in the University of Alberta. In all, I have been just adjusting pretty slowly to staying at home while doing paleontological research. As a paleontologist, you deal with dinosaurs, ancient rock beds, and dating methods. This is a complex topic, so let's just start with the concept of deep time. Michael, what exactly is meant by deep time? So deep time is a geological concept uh, developed during the 18th century by a Scottish geologist. It describes the long history of our planet and the changes the Earth has experienced throughout its very ancient and long history. So humans' perspective of time is very small and short on the scales of hours, days, months, and years, and, and centuries. Uh, by comparison, by our understanding of time, our, the Earth is very, very ancient. It is challenged for us humans, right, to understand the amount of time that has passed on the Earth. So, how do geologists measure a thousand years, let alone a million or billion years? So, to put things into perspective to uh, the general public, assume the average human lifespan is about 70 years. With this, 14 lifetimes is already a thousand years. 14 generations is already a thousand years. Uh, 14,000 lifetimes is a million years. And then 14 million lifetimes is a billion years. So that's a lot of human lives. But uh, for a billion years, that's a lot of human lives for uh, to have occurred for a billion years to have passed. Uh, so geologists must be able to understand the vast expanse of deep time. So what we do to describe deep time is use the geological time scale. The geological time scale is basically divided into different time units for us to uh, compartmentalize the age of the Earth. So the longest division of time is called an eon, right? And so we are there's about three different eons or four different eons in the planet on, on the planet. We are currently in the Phanerozoic eon. Um, and therefore, uh, dividing further, eons can be divided into eras. And the most famous era is the Mesozoic era, which is the time of the dinosaurs. And currently, we are in the Cenozoic era. Eras are then divided into periods, and the most famous periods of all time is happened in the Mesozoic era during the time of the dinosaurs, was the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. Which are periods with uh, in a subset, which are periods within the Mesozoic era. Um, we are currently now in the Quaternary period of the Cenozoic era. P 
periods are divided into epics, not like an epic battle, but epics, E-P-O-C-H-S. And period, like I said, periods are divided into epics. So for the Cretaceous period, we had the early and the late Cretaceous epics uh, within that period. And we are currently in the Holocene epic of the Quaternary period during the Cenozoic era of the Phanerozoic Eon. So geologists came up with these time divisions by observing stratigraphy, or the layering of rocks on the planet by using Steno's laws of stratigraphy. So there are about five laws of, uh, five laws of Steno's laws of stratigraphy. First mm -hmm. law is the law of superposition, which is just basically saying, stating that the younger layer of rock sits atop of the older layer of rock. The younger rock will always be on top of the older layer. Then we have the law of original horizontality, which is the layer of sedimentary rocks that are deposited flat. They're never deposited in a vertical or any other angle. They're always deposited flat. Then we have the law of lateral continuity, which is the rock layer or is basically horizontal. They're continuous in a, in a spatial distribution over mm -hmm. a vast amount of area. And so if you had a rock layer with uh, erosion, basically like a gully, right? If we can, if you had a rock layer the rock layer would be continuous all the way throughout if it was deposited at the same time. So this rock layer would be the same rock layer over here. Then we have the law of cross-cutting relationships. So for example, we have rock layer A and then rock layer B. So rock layer A is younger than rock layer B, so rock layer B was deposited first. And then you have some sort of intrusion cutting along through those rock layers, which we call intrusion C. And so intrusion C will always be younger compared to rock layer A and B. And then we have the, finally we have the law of faunal succession, which is basically the fossils in the rock layers are succeeded or succeed each other vertically in an order that can be identified over spatial distance over an area. And this allows rock layers to be identified and dated by the fossils themselves. This is also called, uh, or what we know as, as uh, relative dating. And so relative dating is just basically, it doesn't put a numerical value on the age of those rocks. It just basically tells you the relationships between the rock layers. All it's telling you is that this rock layer is older than this rock layer. There is no numerical value attached to it. But where we get numerical values for these rock layers is called absolute dating. And that measures the decay of radio uh, radioactive isotopes using different radiometric dating methods in the rocks, which can give a numerical date for that rock layer. Well, perhaps a good jumping off point for our dive into determining the age of things is a method called radiometric dating. How would you best describe radiometric dating and how it works? So radiometric dating is a method used to date rocks uh, using trace radioactive material or unstable nuclei that are in the trace amounts in the rock itself. Uh, essential, so what's essential to this discussion, or what I should cover before I go any further, is what exactly is a nuclei. So a nuclei is an atom that is characterized um, by the number of protons and neutrons. So for example, uh, carbon has six protons always in its uh, atomic nucleus, um, but there's different variations of carbon, different isotopes of carbon that is based on the number, the different counts of neutrons that it can have in its nucleus. So for one uh, carbon isotope, it's called carbon-12, and that's stable for carbon where it contains six protons and six neutrons within its nucleus. So carbon-14 is the unstable radioactive isotope of carbon, where it has six protons and eight neutrons within its nucleus. So carbon-14 is radioactive, right, and will spontaneously transform over a certain amount of time to one of its stable uh, isotope item, atoms, which would be nitrogen-14. The amount of time uh, for carbon-14 to radioactive, uh, radioactively decay is over a certain amount of time which is its half-life, which is about 5,000 years old. And there's different uh, half-lives for different radioactive uh, isotopes. Uh, different radioactive isotope elements uh, will have different half-lives. This transformation process, like I said, is called radioactive decay. Uh, it is a result that the, uh, it results in the changes of the neutron, the protons of the original atom or the parent atom into another atom which is completely separate from its parent atom, or called the daughter atom. 
So there are different types of radioactive decay processes or uh, different how proton uh, how those radioactive isotopes decay in certain pathways, right? So mm -hmm. all the processes result in the parent atom radioactively decaying into the daughter atom. And so this radioactive decay process can be described by this equation where n which is the n which is the daughter atom the number of daughter atoms equals is proportional to the number of parent atoms in that system times the exponential powered to the minus lambda which is the decay constant times time times the the time you're trying to find right and so once you have all the information all you're trying to find is t which is time um, so lambda is that funky Greek alphabet letter is the decay constant, like I said, which describes how fast a nuclei will decay from the parent to the daughter atom, and the half life will change, like I said, dependent on the nuclei or the stable or the radioactive isotope. The equation that expresses or figure out the half life of a certain uh, radioactive isotope, or is the is the amount of time for uh, for half of the parent atom to decay to the daughter atom is t, the t half-life, is equal to the natural log times 2 divided by the decay constant. It's how you figure out the half-life of said isotope. So there are different radiometric methods with vastly different half-lives. C14 to N14 has a half-life of 5,730 years. Uranium-238, which is an, uh, an isotope of uranium, to lead-206 has a half-life of about 4.4 billion years. Mm -hmm. Well, people are probably also aware of the term radiocarbon dating. Michael, what is radiocarbon dating, and how and why does a person use it? So, radiocarbon dating is a method for determining the age of a certain item that contains organic material Material by calculating the number of parent C14 to nitrogen-14 in that said specimen. So, radioactive carbon-14 is being produced uh, continuous, continuously in our atmosphere by cosmic rays. And the following process is described by here. Um, so you have nitrogen-14 just in our atmosphere uh, all the time, and then it encounters a cosmic ray, which is a, a neutron. And that neutron hits uh, the nitrogen atom and then causes a, a loss of a proton from that impact in forming carbon-14. Um, carbon-14 then rapidly oxidizes to CO2. And the CO2, that radioactive CO2, enters the organism, a plant, basically, through photosynthesis or any photosynthesizing organism. And then that carbon-14 is then in the plant, and then whatever organism eats that plant, becomes that radioactive carbon becomes incorporated into that organism. And then whatever eats that organism gets that carbon-14 as well. So it's a continuous, it's, a, it's the food chain. Right of how the carbon radioactive carbon fourteen enters our body. So, once that organism dies, it is no longer taking in carbon fourteen, that radioactive carbon, because it, because it's dead. Um, thus, the radioactive decay clock can therefore begin, and then you can accurately date um, the specimen using uh, carbon fourteen. So, carbon fourteen decays from C fourteen into over a certain amount of time into nitrogen 14 and then with an electron and then as a byproduct and then a, a neutrino which this is i will not go into what a neutrino is because this is not a physics podcast so for example a sample is placed into a mass spectrometer a spectrometer uh, which is basically a device to detect uh the amounts of certain elements within an object right so you put it place it in a mass spec and the, it determines the amount of C14 and N14 present in that sample. Uh, and once you figure out the amount of C14 to N14 is in that sample, you can apply the half-life equation uh, to determine the age of that specimen. So a way to calibrate or a way to verify that this method is accurate is by using uh, use, is to do a calibration test, right? So scientists know that radiocarbon dating is accurate based on these calibration studies using known ages of objects and then radiometrically uh, uh, date them to cross verify them. So, for example, we can date tree rings because tree rings give us the known uh, 
time or the known age of that organism and the mm -hmm. 14 date that tree and to and basically they add equal up to each other and so we can therefore therefore verify the uh, carbon 14 is an accurate uh, dating method so carbon 14 or radioactive radiocarbon dating is often applied to archaeological sites in anything younger than 50,000 years in the past um, because there is a limit on carbon-14 uh, method dating, right? Uh, it can only go up to 50,000 years before all the carbon has been radioactively decayed out of that uh, organic material. Now, what a lot of people may not realize is that there are other forms of carbon dating used instead of or in conjunction with standard radiocarbon dating. What are these other methods and when are they used? So... One example of a, another type of radiometric dating is uranium-238 to lead-206, which has a half-life of about 4.4 billion years and is used to date igneous and metamorphic rocks on the scale of tens of millions of years to tens of billion years ago, right? And this method is commonly measured in zircons, right? It was a tiny little mineral found in igneous rocks. Uh, but you can use other minerals to measure this uh, to measure this radiometric dating, uh, such as monzite and titanite. Zircons are unique because they incorporate uranium into their atomic structure, into their crystalline structure, but they reject lead when they're forming. So therefore, any newly formed zircon deposit, any newly formed zircons will contain no lead within their crystal structure. And any lead found in the zircon is radiogenic. It decayed from a uranium-238 isotope. So we can know the rate of decay for uranium, right? You have uranium-238 into lead. Uh, so figuring out the sample, that when you analyze the sample, you figure out the ratios between lead to uranium in that specimen or in that zircon and be, and can be used to reliably determine that age of that rock. Another uranium uh, radiometric date uh, dating method is uranium-235, another a different type of uh, mm. unstable uranium-235, uh, another unstable uranium uh, isotope. And, and that goes into lead-207. So this method has a half-life of about uh, 710 million years, and it can be used to date younger igneous rock, right, and metamorphic rocks. And they use the same method in zircons, right, to determine the age of these said rocks. Another method is potassium-40 into argon-40. Um, this has a half-life of about 1.25 billion years and is used in dating uh, rocks that are more than 100,000 years old. Right, and you would look at certain materials such as micas, which is a phyllosilicate, which is just a sheet mineral. If anybody's uh, geologically inclined, or clay minerals, or volcanic ash, or evaporites, which is basically like your gypsum, right, um, which is uh, deposited in evaporated uh, lake deposits or salty lake deposits, and they are used for this method. There are a plethora of other methods, but for brevity, these are the three main ones to date really, really old material. There are other methods that date younger material that are not that include carbon-14, but use different other methods or different other uh, unstable isotopes to record those much younger dates. What about the age of the Earth? Michael, according to all the data gathered, how old is the Earth and what methods have been used to date our planet as accurately as possible? So the earliest human writings had the notion that the Earth had a beginning, right? 
albeit a religious in origin. The Genesis story of the Bible was influential because many early scholars used or took inspiration from this text to determine or try to determine the age of the earth, even though they failed shortly. Um, one man, or everyone knows about this guy, one man, James Usher, a 17th century Irish bishop, counted up the gaps or like the genealogy oh, yeah. within gen in Genesis. Yeah, in the book of yeah, in the book of Genesis and other ancient texts to figure out the Earth's age. And so Usher, surprisingly, had a really precise precise date on the age of the Earth when he uh, counted up the begats in, in the book, in that book. And he deduced that the Earth was created on October 22nd, 4004 BC, at 6 p.m. <laughs> on a Earth Saturday. Size. Very, very <laughs> oddly precise. Amazing. Um, However, during the 18th century, uh, other scientists have suggested that the Earth's age was much, much older. Um, one such scientist calculated the age of the Earth to be about, um, based on the fact that the Earth, oh, he assumed that the Earth started out as a molten ball of, of rock, which is not a bad assumption. Mm -hmm. And then he basically figured out the cooling rate of, uh, of iron and then calculated the age of the Earth as approximately 74,000 years old which is much older than 6,000 years, but not old enough for the age of the Earth. <laughs> um, James Hutton, a 18th century Scottish geologist, concluded that the age of the Earth was unimaginable, that an insurmountable time has passed on the planet for us to comprehend. Um, he based this uh, idea on rock formations in Scotland. There is a famous rock locality called Seekers Point in Scotland, or mm -hmm. Hutton's Unconformity. And... The amount of time for this uh, outcrop or this rock uh, exposure, the amount of time for that to happen was vast, was vastly immense. So in this picture in Seekers Point, we have steep, steeply dipping Silurian gray wackies going in almost a vertical direction, right? If we imagine that this gray whack was originally was deposited horizontally, it would then have to tilt and almost hmm. 90 degrees and then in this yellow line here we have this basically an erosion happening so you had an erosional surface and then you'd have another rock deposit happening over top of that and then it's slightly tilted again and so the amount of time for that to happen huh. is vast and this is why he deduced at the age of the earth he didn't put a date to it he just said it's really, really old, and we have no idea how old it is. But we know it's not 6,000 years old. <laughs> so to date the age of the Earth, scientists must date the, the, date the oldest rocks it was using, that are present on Earth's surface by using radiometric dating, uh, basically within the 20th century when radioactivity was discovered. So the oldest rocks on the planet are the Acosta Nice in northwest Canada. And it is dated to be about around 4.3, 4.03 billion years old. Um, wow. But there's also older minerals than this rock. The oldest minerals on the planet are the Jack Hill zircons, like I said earlier about zircons, yeah. um, in Australia. And they are to be about 4.4 billion years old. And this is not the exact date of the planet. None of these samples record the true age of the planet because... Uh, Earth's original surface material is no longer present due to the recycling of, of the Earth from plate tectonics. So there's no original crust left on the planet. So the Acosta Nice and the Jack Hill Zircons are some of the last remaining early Earth crust on the planet, which is completely fascinating. So there must be some other way to determine the age of the Earth. For this, we are mm -hmm. looking at the building blocks of the solar system basically meteorites and these meteorites formed at the same time the solar system formed and that's formed the same time as planet earth formed in the early solar system and so when we dated these meteorites that came crashing down onto our planet and been collected they do did have zircons within their crystalline structure and so by using various uh radiometric tests mostly a uh, uranium to lead dating the age of the solar system is around four and a half billion years old, 4.55 billion years old, and the Earth would been have forming at that time. So the age of the Earth is four and a half billion years old. Wow, so fascinating. Uh, here's an intriguing question, though. How about our moon? Do we know how old the moon is?
Um, this is similar to figuring out the age of the Earth. Um, scientists have assumed that the moon has formed around the same time as the Earth did. Um, the process, the likely process that caused the formation of the moon, uh, probably resulted in a Mars-sized object colliding with the Earth in the early solar system. Um, scientists think that uh, that this most this is most likely the answer, but based on the stable orbit and or circular orbit of the moon. If the moon was like captured, right? If it was another body that came in and was captured by Earth's gravity, right? The orbit of that captured body would be highly elliptical. So we expect yes. that it was collided, and then a lot of debris was around the Earth, basically like the ring of Saturn, and then that co that debris was coalesced into what we see now as the moon. The moon's age should be slightly younger than the age of the Earth. So with astronauts bringing back lunar samples of basalt rock, which is a type of igneous rock, um, scientists use uranium lead dating uh, on these rocks. And the mm -hmm. age of the moon was came out to about 4.54 billion years old. So it's consistent with the age of the early solar system and with the early Earth. So it's basically... Uh, the same thing that happened with the early Earth. We just got these rocks from the planet, um, or from the early solar system for these meteorites, and we did the same thing with the lunar samples. We just dated them, and then we concluded that the age of the of the moon is roughly around the same age as the early Earth. As a paleontologist, you deal with dinosaurs, ancient rock beds, and dating methods, as well as how we can measure the age of not just the Earth, but everything on it. But how can we scientifically deduce the age of a dinosaur fossil? So paleontologists determine the age of dinosaur fossils by radiometrically dating the sediments in which they are found in, which the sediments which the fossils are found in or surrounded by, either above or below or mixed in between. So dinosaur fossils do not have any of the carbon-14, the radioactive carbon within their fossil structure. Um, all the carbon-14 has been lost due to fossilization, nor do the fossils have uranium within their structure. So if the fossils were buried in sediments with volcanic ash, we would be able to uh, use the uh, potassium argon dating uh, to determine the fossil's age because it's mixed in with that sediment. So if there's any volcanic ash surrounding uh, surrounding the fossil, we will look uh, for rock. I'm sorry. If there isn't any volcanic ash in the surrounding sediments, we will look for rock layers that would have any sort of igneous material uh, that can be radiometrically dated above or below that fossil layer. And to determine an age range, it's not going to be a precise date, it's going to be a range of dates, right? It would be like a fossil could be from 75 million years ago to about 74.5 yes. million years ago. If you have, uh, that would be an age range. So with this, we can accurately date the age of a sedimentary rock between two layers, which is uh, better than no time range or better than not having an age at all. So it wouldn't be relative dating, it would be absolute dating, but with the with our with error bars attached to it. Some critics of these methods will say that scientists employ a kind of circular reasoning when dating the fossil record, that rocks are assigned geologic ages based on the fossil assemblages which they contain, and the fossils in turn are arranged on the basis of their assumed evolutionary relationships. As a paleontologist who deals with fossil dating every day, what is your response to this? When we assign geological ages from fossils, uh, is based on relative age dating methods, like I said earlier, and the law of fossil succession. This technique is also called biostratigraphy, right? So stratigraphy, the rock layers, but looking at the organisms within the rock layer itself. Um, there is no exact date for these fossils uh, because it's relative dating, but only stating that fossil A, right, is older than fossil B based on the position in that fossil record based on the layer stratigraphy, right, because the oldest layer is on the bottom compared to the layer at the top. However, if we have sediments surrounding those fossils that can be radiometrically dated, we can deduce the age of that fossil and that rock layer itself. Overall, it is not a circular argument, circular argument but a buildup of evidence demonstrating that the age of the Earth is very, very ancient. Mm. 
Okay, I think we've cleared up one or two misconceptions about dating methods, but how do we know that a rock, for instance, that is being dated is giving us a correct result? What if the sample is contaminated in some way? The answer to this question would be uh, looking at Concordia diagrams. And so here in this Concordia diagram, scientists can compare uh, two isotopic value or two isotopic data from two uh, uranium lead systems, as I said earlier. So we have uh, lead 206 over uranium 238 on the y-axis and lead 207 over lead, uh, uranium 235 on the x-axis. These two uh, uh, isotopic systems uh, have varying different uh, have different uh, half-lives and they all the parent uh, isotope always goes to its uh, daughter isotope so uranium-238 will always go to lead-206 and uranium-235 will always go to lead-207 in an undisturbed system uh, the two isotopic values will form a Concordia curve and is that uh, bent curve uh, in the graph. So if the system becomes open and loses lead, uh, the position of the uh, isotopic value will be displaced, right, from the Concordia. It would no longer follow that trend line. This displacement is usually a metamorphic event, right, is when two, for example, two condas colliding, right, of a assault, and then that squeezing and pressure will mm. allow lead to escape the system of the zircon or wherever it is. So when you do this, multiple samples will be analyzed from that rock, right? Uh, but we'll have differing amount of lead loss, right? Which would be the black dots in this graph because there is no constant rate of lead loss when it's in a metamorphic, when it's being metamorphized. And so you will get a best fit line, which would be that dotted line. Um, so you do this linear regression, right? Uh, and that would be, and that is called your discordia line. And that determines the age of crystallization. So you can also get the age of that rock, right? But also you can figure out the age at which, where that metamorphic event happened. So T0 would be the age of crystallization. So for example, it would be around 2 billion years ago. But T asterisk is the lead loss event, which is less than 5 billion years ago, which is pretty interesting. So we can demonstrate that a rock sample has been altered, right? But we can also still accurately date its crystallization and also figure out when that metamorphic event happened and when it lost all that lead, despite the rock sample being altered. Well, speaking of contamination, what about those people who have claimed to have found something anomalous or anachronistic? Uh, a dinosaur that dates as only a few thousand years old rather than millions, for instance. We hear these stories a lot. Could these people be on to something, or is it a case of misunderstanding the science? This is a, entirely a case of misunderstanding. Uh, dinosaur bones are Mesozoic in era and have, and any time there's been a date of these dinosaur bones using graded carbon dating, has always yielded a false date, right? of a few thousand to a few tens of thousand years of old years old even though the fossil itself is we know is millions of years old as demonstrated by radiometrically dating the sediments that surround them with radioisotopes other than carbon 14 such as uranium lead and uh, potassium argon methods the original carbon 14 in these mesozoic dinosaur bones are all gone and whatever C14 is present within these bones, they are geologically recent, as in they happened probably within the last few thousand years that they were either um, added due to like uh, groundwater penetration or, uh, or diagenetic processes or bacteria or biofilms that put these carbon-14 uh, isotopes within the dinosaur fossils themselves. So the, the, the new radiocarbon, the fossil bone min mineral, is, is carbonate incorporated into the crystal structure of the bone itself during fossilization. Um, like I said, through recrystallization or through diagenetic processes, which is diagene diagenesis, like uh, I haven't talked about yet, is basically extremely, extremely low grade and often not considered uh, metamorphism. It's extremely low grade metamorphism uh, in sedimentary rocks that lithifies them or makes it solid, basically. 
And like I said, in some cases, uh, bacterial activity uh, or radioactive decay products can also add uh, radiocarbon to the bone. So people who claim that they found Mesozoic bone, Mesozoic dinosaur bones, uh, to be a few thousand years old based on radiocarbon dating, are not onto anything. The, it's very misleading because uh, all the carbon fourteen is no longer present within these dinosaur bones anymore. Okay, that was great, Mike, and thanks so much for going into such detail about this fascinating but sometimes confusing topic. I hope it's answered at least one or two questions people have about dating the Earth, dating fossils, and deep time itself. As before, I'll leave contact details and social media links in the description below. And all that's left to say is thanks once again for coming back on the Evolution Soup. Thank you for having me. It's always been a pleasure talking about geology and paleontology to uh, people who are interested in the subject because I am vastly interested in this and I love uh, spreading the word about geology and paleontology to everyone. Thank you for having me.